Good morning. As we center ourselves, get settled, uh, I'll read the centering thought, and if everyone could silence their cell phones, please. This is from Marcus Aurelius. When facing whatever happens outside your control, be calm. When taking actions for which you are responsible, be fair. In other words, when whether acting or reacting, your aim is the aid and betterment of others in fulfillment of nature's law. The music I'm playing this morning as a prelude is by Eugenie Rusherell, and she is a um, New Orleans composer and has very deep roots in France, um, has a there's there's a family castle. I would like to have a family castle. And this is the entire suite that this is from is about her family castle, which has been around since the Middle Ages. And it's with the idea of tuning out and tuning in. She tunes out to what things were like in the Middle Ages, what was like going on in her castle at that time and it was her castle it was it was the family like i said the family castle the first part this is the first um movement of the suite and it's called un matinee au lavoir and what it is is it's a public wash house and it's a it's a shallow basin it's outdoors and later more recently the family converted this because the people would just go wash their clothing there and that's what you're having at the beginning of the piece. Um, but then you'll know when this happens. Um, suddenly it moves over and we are in modern times where the family has con converted the washing area to a swimming pool. So you'll hear going back and forth, tuning in and tuning out.
Thank you, Barbara. So wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in person and on Zoom. I'm your service associate this morning. My name is Rin Corbet. I'm a little over six feet tall with untamed gray hair, wearing a blue shirt, gray pants, brown shoes, and white socks. I'm a boomer, as you might tell. Summit is a liberal religious community bound together by shared principles drawn from world religions, humanist teachings, nature and science, philosophy and personal practices. We aspire to be a religion of love and inclusion. The mission of Summit is to commit ourselves to building a more compassionate, just and sustainable world. If you are new to Summit or Unitarian Universalism, and would like to know more about us, we invite you to go to our website, summituuf.org, click on the visitors button and fill out our connection card. Someone will follow up with you. This morning, we are joined by Reverend Kathleen Owens, a retired parish minister who served several congregations, including First UU Church of San Diego for 14 years. She received her Master's of Divinity from Star King School for the Ministry in 2004, and she is here to help us learn how to tune out to tune in. Welcome, Reverend Owens. Announcements. We have two announcements this morning, Mark and Carol. Are you here? Yes, come up. Hi, everybody. Oh, I was supposed to follow you, Mark. Sorry about that. Um, today's the big day. Joe Ferrara is coming um, to play at 2 o'clock here in the sanctuary. And he's just this wonderful baritone voice and guitar. And this is his third time here, I believe. And he's just wonderful and relaxing. He's got a repertoire of all kinds of music. So it should be a lot of fun. We are at, the music committee is asking for a suggested donation of $15. But if you're not able to cover that, you're welcome to come anyway. So we really hope you all show up, or a lot of you. It should be a lot of fun. Thanks. Two o'clock. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just want to uh, let you know that beginning this week, Summit's entering into a contract with a business across the street um, to rent their employees parking spaces. So beginning next week, and you'll see these this sign on the 10 spaces on the northeast end of our parking lot. And what we're um, entering into contract to do is to provide uh, this company parking um, Monday through Friday in the morning through early evening. Um, the weekends, those are still our spaces, morning, noon, and night. Even during weekdays, those spaces will be ours in the evening after six. And that's what the, the signage says at the bottom. It's it's always Summit parking in those other times. So don't be fooled when you see these big this big red portion of the sign on Sunday mornings, you can still use those spaces. And if you're here during the week, what I would suggest is you make use of the parking spaces in the main portion of our parking lot. And this arrangement is not going to affect the six spaces around the salon. So um, FYI, thank you. For more than 10,000 years, the Kumeyaay people lived on this land, stretching from the shores of the Pacific south to Ensenada, east to the sand dunes of the Colorado River, and north to Warner Springs Valley. We acknowledge that this fellowship resides on unceded Kumeyaay land and honor the continuing presence of the Kumeyaay Nation. Our chalice lighting is from the Gates of Repentance. Bless us with peace. O source of peace, Lead us to peace, a peace profound and true. Lead us to a healing, to master all that drives us to war within ourselves. 
and with others. O source of peace, bless us with peace. Now let's stand as we are able to sing our you you hymn. Bless for truth in sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell, to dwell together in peace, to seek, to seek knowledge, knowledge and freedom, freedom and, to and to help, help one another in fellowship. fellowship. This, this is, is our aspiration. Our reading this morning is by Reverend Elizabeth Nguyen. For when I really don't want to learn this, spirit, I would really rather not learn this. Didn't think I needed to. I thought someone else could do it. Thought a leader was coming to do it. Thought the young people could do it. Or the elders could do it. Or the professionals. Or... I don't want to learn it because it means letting go of something I hold dear. Letting go of being someone who knows the answers. Letting go of being someone who doesn't know. Letting go of the way I see the world. Letting go of how I might have to change. Letting go of certainty of logic, facts, of control. Of the myth that you can live on this earth and not harm. Or the myth that I can't learn anything new. Help me to learn it, please. And then help me to live what I have learned and do right by the gift of being taught. Now let's rise as we're able to sing hymn 108, My Life Flows On in Endless Song.
It is our joys and concerns time. And I just want to say it is a joy for me to be with you this morning. Thank you for the invitation. And I hope Pastor Casey is enjoying her vacation, well earned and deserved. And it's good to be together. Usually at this time, it is a time that joys or concerns can be emailed or text, texted to Pastor Casey, Casey or the service worship associate throughout the week or handwritten. As we have not received any this morning, we know that there are joys and concerns living in our hearts right now. So I wanna invite us to take a moment in silence to pay attention to our breath and our beating heart and to center on that joy or that concern that is in your mind and breathe with it for a moment. May you be well. Amen. So I have a story, and if uh, if you would like to see the pictures of the story up close, you're welcome to join me right here. I know Mary Carter Vale is not with us today, but I'm excited to get to share this story. Hey, thanks. Hi, I'm Kathleen. I'm glad you're here. Well, our story today is called Unplugged, Ella Gets Her Family Back. And I'm sorry, the adults, I'll try to show you the pictures, but the little ones get first choice, okay? Ella raced down the stairs as she was excited about having blueberry waffles for breakfast because it was Friday. And because she had thought of the perfect word, jinx, or playing hangman with her brother, Carlos. Her father sat at his computer in the living room, reading the news. Good morning, Daddy, she said. Without turning around in his chair, he said, good morning, and kept on looking at the screen. Carlos, her brother, was already at the kitchen table playing a video game. Good morning, Carlos, Ella said, but he didn't seem to hear her. She quickly drew out the hangman scaffold and put four blank spaces below it, but Carlos just ignored her. Ella's mother was on the phone and with a head nod to the table where the cereal and the milk were, she pointed to that for breakfast. But you said we could have blueberry waffles today as a treat, Ella said. Hold on, as mom was talking on the phone. I'm sorry, Ella, I forgot. We'll do it tomorrow morning. And look, he spilled his cereal bowl as he played his game. Well, Ella's older sister, Maya, walked past the table toward the door, reading her cell phone and all the text messages. Wait, Ella said, you promised to do my hair before school. Maya knew how to do all sorts of beautiful braids, even inside out ones. Tomorrow, Maya said as she walked out the door, I have to meet my friends now. Ella scowled. Her family used to have breakfast together every morning and talk and laugh and play guessing games. Now all they did was stare at their screens and use their phones. Why can't we all talk together the way we used to, she asked. But no one answered her because they were all on their screens. Uh-oh. That afternoon, Ella rushed home from school, looked for her dad because they were gonna go on a bike ride, but he wasn't home yet. And suddenly Ella had an idea. She went through the house collecting the charger cords and the phones and the laptops and the portable small electronics, and she put them all in a basket. And where she took them, she left a post-it note that said, talk to Ella. Well, just after she got all of them collected in the basket, 
Her mother arrived home and wanted to plug in her phone. Ella, have you seen my charger? I left it right here on the counter. In here, Ella, holding up the laundry basket with all the cords. Maya came home from school and after a few minutes said, hey, what have you done with my iPod? In here, Ella said, pointing to the laundry basket, still holding it. And then Carlos came in and said, hey, what'd you do with all my stuff? What's going on? Her father said, coming in the door. Come on, Ella, Maya said impatiently. My phone battery is dead. I need to plug it in so my, I can get a text from my friends where I, to tell me where I'm going to meet them. And Ryan is coming over to play games. Give me my stuff, Carlos said. I wish that nobody in this family had phones or video games or computers, she shouted. Oh, shouted. But Ella's mom and dad sat her down and asked, is this your way of telling us you think you're old enough for your own phone? Her dad said, do you feel left out because you're the only one in the family without a phone? No, Ella said, I don't want a phone yet. I just want my family back. I want things to be just like they were before you all got so plugged in. Hmm, what do you think's gonna happen? Well, Ella returned everybody's cords and gadgets and phone chargers. Her father plugged in his laptop while her sister ran off with her iPod and the phone charger and Carlos went to his room with his video games. But when Ella came downstairs the next morning, the rest of the family were all sitting at the table smiling and looking at her. No one had their computer or phone. There they were waiting for her. Her father said, Ella, we're gonna make some changes. Breakfast time is now family time. And a big smile crossed Ella's face. They wanted to talk to her after all. Her mother served them all blueberry waffles. Eat up, said her dad. You'll need your energy. Why? Mother said, because we're all going on a bike ride today. When? Ella exclaimed. Right after I beat you at Hangman, said Carlos. Dream on, Ella said, because she already had a terrific word in mind. Unplugged. And on the refrigerator, they posted this note that read, the Whitman Diaz family is proud to announce they will be unplugged Saturday mornings and Sunday nights. No calls, texts, or emails. Have a nice day. And that is our story about being unplugged. Thanks for coming up here and looking at this with me. I, we sing, do we go? Children, are the children leaving today? Yeah. Okay, Perfect. this is their yeah. recessional. Thank you. We get everybody to sing, you'll know it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, for our next hymn, it's new to you, I'm told. So I want to invite you to grab that old book called a hymnal. <laughs> And turn to page 17. Um, the words of this are from William Blake, and it's one of my favorite songs. And it goes with our service theme today. But because it's new, um, I've been asked to 
sing the first verse, and then you join in. And I'm asking you to look at your hymnal so that you might follow the notes, because toward the end, there's about seven notes for just one word. But you'll see how it goes. I'm not a natural song leader, so you'll bear with me and we'll enjoy this together. And I know I'll enjoy it a lot more when you jump in whenever you can. Okay. Every night and every morn, some to misery are born. Every morn and every night, some are born to sweet delight. Joy and woe are both in fine, both in for the soul divine, under every grief and pine. Runs a joy with silk in one. It is right, it should be so. We were made for joy and woe. And when this we rightly know, safely through the world. We go. Thank you. I invite you now to join me in a time of meditation and prayer. And after the spoken words, we'll just have a moment of silence for the prayers that linger in your own hearts. Spirit of life and love, how grateful we are to be here this morning, that the strength of our bodies allow us to come together in community. And in our joy of being together, we are mindful that this can't happen for everyone, whether it be their own illness that prevents them from coming, or maybe they don't know about Unitarian Universalism yet, but we are mindful of those who are suffering. And we think especially of those who are experiencing the wildfires. May those victims find hope and healing and restoration. May those who are fighting those fires be safe. May weather help and not hinder the work. We think of the civilians killed in the Sudan, in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Israel. Spirit of love, we do such harm to one another. May we find the wisdom to end conflict, to stop the harm. And because we have been here today, may our hearts be opened. May we be renewed because we have been together. May we be renewed and strengthened for the days ahead so that we might do the work that love would have us do tomorrow and this week. May it be so. Amen. Well, what a whirlwind we have had in this country this last week or month. And we know there is more to come. These events that we've all experienced have created a lot of uncertainty, 
some fear, maybe some joy, maybe some sadness, and everything in between. And with all our ongoing concerns, as well as, I know I've been more and more concerned about the climate crisis and weather disasters, the upcoming elections, I'll be honest, I'm worried and concerned, and the possibility of political violence and injustice on a global scale that can so easily feel personal. It can be way too much for this body and mind, for our bodies and minds to contain. You know, it used to be that having information was a good thing. To be in the know and be able to anticipate events but when these devices, these little phones came into our lives, it felt good to be connected. It felt good to learn and be aware of what was happening across the world, across the country. And I know that there have been some individuals who once felt isolated, but because of the phones and their access to the internet, they have found real community in the digital world. And we are so tuned in. It's really hard not to look out for the breaking news every time we pick up our phone, even if it's to make a phone call. Nope, I got to check, right? What just happened on CNN or what just happened on my news source? It's costing all of us. Did you hear Ella's plea in the story? I just want my family back. I want things like they used to be before you got it plugged in. She's so brave, isn't she? And wise to know what she wants and to ask for it. These devices have been a blessing and they can be a burden or a curse. From big movie screens and long films, to TVs with more channels and stories than we can possibly watch, to the tiniest of our screens, the phones that are connected to the World Wide Web and all that information. We are on an information, misinformation, disinformation overload that narrows our vision, limits our field of engagement, and diminishes our attention span. And in this online world, it's too easy to lose sight of the natural world. Back in the 1950s and 60s, when we were exposed to advertising and it really took off, we were the consumer. But today, we are the consumed. Our focused attention and our time are now the products being sold to corporations. And being so tuned in to that online world can create lifestyles that leave us consuming more and relating to one another less. And the more we learn and take in all that breaking news, the more overwhelmed and anxious we can become. And even on vacation, being tuned in to the uncontrollable events in our country and our world impacts us. It happened to me recently, I'm afraid. Surrounded by family and natural beauty, I woke up that first night on vacation at 2 a.m. filled with anxiety and fear. At first, I thought it was just jet lag and being overtired, but it happened again the second night, and it was much worse on the third night. And even though I wasn't on my phone really as much at all, I was still consciously and unconsciously aware that life was feeling out of control. And the fears that I live with all the time, the environment and our country and what could happen, just had me tied up. And all I could think about through the fears and the tears and anxieties was that I just wanted to go home and huddle in my place of comfort and control. Now, I tried to think of other thoughts. I did some self-talk, right? Like, it's going to be okay, just breathe, count your breath, but it didn't help. 
And from my fundamentalist childhood Christian faith, the first verse of an old gospel song welled up in me. You know, you can take the girl out of the church, but it's hard to take the church out of the girl, especially the music. But this first verse, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It's a beautiful thought. And Horatio Spafford, who wrote those words, knew what he was talking about because his wife and four children were in a ship accident and the ship sank. The wife survived, but their four children died. And knowing this, he still could write those words, it is well with my soul, because of his faith in his God. On that third night of my vacation, it was not well with my soul. And while that hymn is a good song, its theology does not resonate with me. It doesn't work. And I lay there that night wondering, what does my you, you faith offer me when I am in the midst of fear and angst? I wanted some reassurance, not that everything would work out all right. I'm not that Pollyanna-ish, but I needed to know that I wasn't without agency, that there was something that I could do to change my circumstance. And I thought about our principles and our sources. And I've been a minister a long time and they are not the most poetic words but could I find something there I needed as I thought about them I needed to feel differently and hopefully better and what my first thoughts of our principles and sources told me was I needed to get out of my own head you see right before our principles and sources listed in this hymnal it says that we are a part of a covenant, a promise among congregations, and I say a promise among members for how we aspire to live our lives in this world. They reminded me of the truth that with all my fears and anxieties, I am not alone, and I still have worth and dignity, and with others, I can do something. This faith connects me to something larger than myself. And though I can't, con I can't change that large global picture or the country picture, I can change the picture around me. And I can change me. Our principles and sources acknowledge everyone's worth. And that means their ideas are as worthy as mine that we can have experiences of transcending awe and wonder. And once we've experienced awe and wonder, we can be encouraged and energized to act, grounding ourselves in the world's religions and philosophies, ensure a wider view, learning our place in the web of existence takes a burden off, but also holds me accountable in relationship with others that I want to lead us to equity and the dismantling of racism and oppression. It's spiritual work. And as I thought through all of this, I started to relax. I started to feel some comfort. I needed to find ways to tune out of the world and tune in to the wisdom that was here in my heart, because my heart belongs to Unitarian Universalism. I needed to be present to what was happening in the now, rather than fearing all the what ifs in the future. Tuning in to this moment and finding a way with others to deal with life's uncertainties is crucial for living a life of peace, hope, and healing. Wren read our centering thought. Marcus Aurelius was an emperor of Rome 
and a philosopher of Stoicism. And I knew him better as an emperor of Rome and never thought I would find inspiration there. But Stoicism offers some inspiration, but tools. Now, it's not a perfect philosophy because it was created by human beings. But the tools that it offers helps one to live a life of peace and some calm and fairness in a world that's full of uncertainty. It's ancient wisdom grounded in reason. And that's how it connects with our faith. You know, way back in the day, the three pillars of Unitarianism was freedom, reason, and tolerance. And we took a lot of pride that our reason could help figure things out. And now, of course, we know our ability to reason can also be flawed, but it's a place to start. We can't rely on reason alone, and it is a gift of our faith that our sources included wisdom and insight from the world's religions and beyond. Unitarian Henry David Thoreau wrote, philosophy's true use is becoming an operating system for the difficulties and hardships of life. And one of the best books I've read lately is Ryan Holiday's book titled, The Obstacle is the Way. And in it, Holiday points out that life often throws uncertainties and obstacles in our path. The good news is we're not at the whim of fate because obstacles can be transformed into a new path if we can adapt and accommodate. About Marcus Aurelius, Holiday writes, from what we know about him, he truly saw each and every obstacle as an opportunity to practice a virtue, patience, courage, humility, reason, justice. The power he held never seemed to go to his head and neither did the stress or burden of it. Holiday shares that overcoming obstacle is a discipline of three critical steps. And that first step is how we look at problems. What is our attitude and approach? The second step is using the energy we have to creatively break down the problem and turn it into an opportunity. And third, cultivating that inner will will allow us to handle defeat and difficulty. Three interdependent, interconnected disciplines, perceptions, or what therapists might call reframing, action, and will. Now, perception is how we see what's happening around us. Our habit is, I know my habit, is to quickly put a judgment on what's happening. Oh my God, that was horrible. This traffic accident is going to make me late. But maybe not. Sometimes we judge before we know all the facts. And so our judgment isn't accurate. Here's a story from ancient wisdom. There was once an old man who had one son and one horse. And one day, his horse broke free, broke free from the pen and went galloping off into the freedom of the nearby hills. The man's neighbors sympathized him and said, oh, what very bad luck you have. You've lost your horse. Why do you say that? The old man replied. Who's to say whether it is bad luck? And sure enough, the very next night, his horse came back and 12 wild horses followed him and went right into the paddock. His one son quickly closed the gate and then his neighbors came over and said, oh my gosh, this is great. What good luck. You had one horse and now you have 13. This is great. And the old man replied, why do you say that? Who's to say if this is good luck? A little while later, the man's one son got on one of the horses and took him out riding, but the horse was still wild and it threw the boy off his back. The boy fell and broke his leg. And of course, 
His neighbors came back and said, oh, what very bad luck that your son has broken his leg. Why do you say that? The old man said. Now you could get annoyed with this old man, right? You're like, wait a minute, dude, come on. But he held his center. Why do you say it was bad luck? And sure enough, a short while later, the militia came through the village conscripting able-bodied young men to the army to go fight in the war where many would lose their lives. But when they saw the son lying there with his broken leg, they passed him by and went on to the next village. His neighbors, what good luck you have. And the old man just smiled. This story and holiday reminds us it isn't the obstacle that we face, but how we react to them, how, whether we can keep our composure and keep in control of our perceptions. Can we wait to see what might happen next before rushing to judgment? And from our perception, action follows, but not action for action's sake. It needs to be right action. Action grounded in our values. Actions that invite courage and creativity, not just force. And when we can slow down to take stock of other people's ideas and opinions about what might be a next right action, then we are creating a larger, wider community. We are creating the next right action that might serve a larger goal for the betterment of more. Our earlier reading about learning something that focuses us to change could be exactly what we need, though we didn't know it at the time. To whatever we face, our job is to respond with hard work, honesty, inclusion of community. This is the way of right action. Our will is our internal power. If action is what we do regarding our situation, our will is what we depend on when our agency has all but disappeared, because sometimes it does disappear. You know, there are times that we can think we see things clearly, that we've engaged in collective action, and yet still the obstacle remains. Conflict, oppression, threats of self-serving leaders, they all continue. The philosophers of Stoicism teach that our actions can be constrained, but our will cannot. Our plans, even our bodies, can be broken, but belief in ourselves? No. No matter how many times we are thrown back, we retain the power to decide to keep going, or to try another way, or at the very least, try to decide on a new aim. Compassion and camaraderie are always options which create connections and opportunities. Holiday reminds us that we don't get to choose what happens to us, but we can always choose how we will feel about it. And when it feels like the obstacles continue, despite our clearest perception, despite community action, we can follow President Lincoln's example of the stoic maxim, bear and forbear. Acknowledge the pain, but trod onward in your tasks. Lincoln's words are good to live by. The task of our lives is to live lives of peace and hope and healing with compassion for and connection to others. And we need our whole interconnected self. For many, the philosophy and spiritual wisdom from Buddhism connects our reason to our bodies in healing and productive ways. Tara Brock is a meditation teacher who I am privileged to have read. And she invites us into building compassion for ourselves first and then for others, and expanding it to our beautiful and flawed world. 
when she was reading the daily news and found that it left her filled with anger, fear, and frustration, she decided to make reading the newspaper into a meditation. She writes, each morning I would open the paper, check the headlines, read a few paragraphs, and then pause. I'd notice my reactions, the thoughts and the feelings of outrage, and I'd allow that experience to move in my mind and body, not denying it, not feeding it, just witnessing my response. And then I began to see that when I opened myself to the full force of my anger, I could sense behind it fear for our world. And as I opened to the fear, it unfolded into the grief around all the suffering that was inevitable. And from that grief arose a deep sense of caring for all humans, animals, trees that would be harmed by the violence I read in the paper. By holding my anger, she says, by holding my feelings of anger and frustration with radical acceptance, I could find my way to caring and wise action. Acceptance of whatever arises in the present moment in us is not a passive act, but rather a mindful presence that allows us to respond to the world from our deepest compassion and wisdom. I have tried to do this when reading the news on my phone or watching the news at night. I don't often succeed but it's called a practice for a reason. Brock offers this reflection. When you find yourself angry in any situation, notice what happens if you just pause and allow yourself to notice the intensity of your thoughts and feelings. And in those thoughts and feelings, can you sense the feeling of hurt under the anger or the feeling of vulnerability and tenderness? of your own heart. My friends, when we can feel our own tenderness and vulnerability, then we can feel it in the people that are near us. When we see tenderness and vulnerability in others, we can choose to act in compassionate ways and create a connection. I have a resource sheet for you. It, there's a second meditation by Tara Brock called RAIN. It's a meditation that can help us address our fears about the world. We are not alone, my friends, not in our brilliance and not in our fears. My prayer for us all is that these practices, these meditations, along with clear perception and right action and the will to be compassionate will allow you to tune out the distractions and tune in to all that is right here in front of you that you will see your way through. May it be so. Amen. I love this place. Holy cow, what a wonderful morning. The music and the readings and the comments, your words. Uh, it's powerful, so wonderful. Your Sunday morning offering is a gift that provides some at UU Fellowship the financial resources to help build a better world together. Every gift is welcome. For those of you on Zoom, the link can be found in the chat box.
closing hymn, number 131, if you need the hymnal, it's Love Will Guide Us. Elizabeth Nguyen. Spirit, I would really rather not learn this. Didn't think I needed to. Help me to learn it, please. And then help me to live what I have learned. For all of us, may it be so. Amen. We close our chalice. Are we, I'm sorry, we close our service by extinguishing the chalice. You are invited to take a five-minute break then and remain here in the sanctuary for a time of community discussion, followed in the salon by coffee and conversation. Please join us next week when our, ah, excuse me, by Mark Bellatini. Go in peace, live simply, gently, at home in yourselves, act justly, Speak justly. Remember the depth of your own compassion. Forget not your power in the days of your powerlessness. Crave peace for all people in the world, beginning with yourselves, and go with the dream of that peace alive in your heart. Please join us next week when our speaker will be Reverend Everett Howe, speaking on forgotten or misremembered people and events from the liberal religious tradition. These overlooked stories may help change how we listen to and talk about history. Our closing circle song, Together Hand in Hand.
Do we have any questions for Reverend Owens? Good morning. Thank you for the talk. I just wanted to let everybody know that we do have a copy of The Obstacle is the Way in the church library if anyone's interested in getting a copy of it. So, and uh, I, that perspective and uh, it really resonated with me. So, thank you for this morning. Well, you're welcome. And I'm, I'm delighted that you have a copy of it. You'll, if you read it, you'll find all a lot more nuggets of inspiration and truth that I could not include in my sermon. <laughs> it was already long enough. But um, I also found that, you know, mixing uh, reason and and not only relying on that, but going in that deeper wisdom path, we need a blend because we are all of that and more. So I am I I commend that book to you, and I put it on that resource sheet. If you can read it, that would be it, you. You might find some other tools that will uh, relate, be relatable. That's great. Thank you. Hi, everybody knows I'm Margo, and thank you for that blessed reminder. <laughs> I think, um, you know, the, I, one of my favorite sayings, and you mentioned it today in, in other ways, from the booth, bless your obstacles, they are your teachers. And the other thing I found so helpful today was something that's been coming to me lately is, you know, a, a good roadmap to navigate through these times of in loveliness, lovely insanity, I call it, and to allow and accept, you know, <clears throat> and to live in the moment. <laughs> but as I think it's also the Zen, show up, pay attention, tell the truth, and stay open to outcome. And Along with allowing and accepting, I a, a dynamic that's coming to me lately to navigate is not only living in the moment, but finding stillness. You know, I I get these, I'm blessed, I get these little note jabs from <laughs> above upstairs. And all this week, I have been getting the bulletin, know everything by knowing nothing. <laughs> and... After what happened, you know, I just found my last week was so crazy. I just found myself so wired, like I felt like I was plugged into a socket. Mm -hmm. So I just kept breathing and relaxing. And after what happened last week, all of a sudden, this past week, and I talked to a lot of people, my clients and friends, see, I just feel in neutral now. I feel I'm idling. <laughs> I'm just kind of sitting here idling and not being idle but just being in that kind of poised readiness. And I find when I do everything by doing nothing, when I go into those stillness as a contrast to all the wildness, I get my answer. Mm -hmm. I get, or at least I get the next bulletin about what to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, and this whole week, I, I one of my favorite uh, beings is the theater of the absurd. And I think we are in the theater of the absurd. And I'm reminded also, one last thing is that in the middle of creativity, I, I don't know where this came from, but there's cycles, they say. And two of the most prominent ones before things really shift gears are chaos and confusion. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, you know, we're in that tumble right now, too. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And yes, I I, I agree. And sometimes it's so because I think I know best, there are times that it is so hard to be accepting of the obstacle. And my default reaction is to want to fight it and <clears throat> force. Um, the beautiful thing about my recent retirement is I am coming more and more to appreciate the stillness, the silence, and 
from that, then things flow so much more freely. And it's like, oh, and then I think I wish I had known this when I was still in active ministry. <laughs> it could have helped, right? Um, it is it, it, uh, slow to learn lessons, but thank you for the reminder of the stillness, because from that, then we can hear and be open. Beautiful. <laughs> it's like it's almost a relief to not know and having myself being such a dualaholic and a noaholic you know it's just i was surprised it is a relief it's like a recess not to know and when i feel the joy in that then i get my answer you know if i'm, if I'm reaching out getting my answer you know there's no space for it to come because i'm too brain locked <laughs> thank you I've been 